Hi, the friends. Today in this video, Professor Carla Hein from the University of Technology in Delft, the Netherlands, will describe the topic of the global petroleum scape. This is a very interesting seminar in which Carla will explain how oil is deeply rooted in our economies and in our daily life activities that is practically invisible. Just think, for example, about the fossil fuels and the plastic materials. As uh, Carla Hein will explain, we really need new imaginaries for new developmental alternatives. Thank you for watching. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this uh, fascinating, um, master, to fascinating program. I very much liked your introduction because it shows that petroleum is always examined and explored only in specific locations and that never gives you the full picture on the scale in which the petroleum industry, the petroleum flows actually function. Um, one quick note to the students and hi everyone, I saw your present notes, uh, please if I speak too quick or if you have a question in between do not hesitate and just uh, let me know, just speak up or let somebody else know that I should, um, well, slow down. Um, the main point that I want to make in this lecture today is one, in order to understand where we are today and to better design the future, we need to understand the long-term past and the ways in which petroleum has shaped our environment in the entire world, which also means that there is a specific role for understanding space. Uh, space in the sense of physical structures, because we can know a lot about economic structures, but that in itself doesn't tell us how it looks on the ground, how people experience it, or how is it, how it is represented. Um, and I should add one more thought. I'm actually using the term petroleum scape rather than saying simply oil scape. Scape is important because it is the space and I'm using it in singular. So I'm not saying petroleum scapes for specific spaces, but really the petroleum scape. In order to show that around the world, all these places of petroleum extraction, consumption, transportation, and so on are interconnected. And the part about petroleum is really because when you Google, oil or you search for oil in archives, you might end up with all kinds of oils and not just petroleum. So that's why I've been choosing, choosing this particular title um, to, 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 to label what we are going to look at. Now, let me walk you through the project and this is not an exam, so you're not required to re remember any specific date, time, place. What I really want you to get out of this is to put on a new lens through which you view the built environment. And in some of my courses, I, I tell my students, so drop your oil, which basically means look at yourself, look at your clothes, your glasses, your jewelry, uh, and just see where is plastic in it. And if it has it, well, you try to strip it off. And then you would see how far petroleum is actually embedded in our environment. Now, to start with, here are global world flows, already a little bit um, outdated, but it still looks very much the same. So oil is mostly transported via ships. There are pipelines, and you've heard about a lot about them, but still much of the flows are maritime flows. In reverse, there are financial flows. So one way we see shipping and the other way we see money flowing, which has a couple of implications. On the one hand, you will see that port cities are a specific location in this map uh, because that's where all these flows come together and where they are being bundled. So you will see around the world particular port city regions standing out. But the other point that I want to make on this map is that if we talk about economics, financial flows, while we have a global map in the background, we don't really end up in specific locations. You can't say, how does the workers' housing in this or that city in Abu Dhabi look like? 
And that's where our discipline comes in. That's where we have to start as uh, people from the spatial sciences to actually make a point. So what I'm arguing is that we shouldn't be studying this, these phenomena separately. The highways in the US and Europe, et cetera, fund the projects that are going up in the Middle East directly. And if we want to make a change, we have to acknowledge that these connections exist. Now, if I'm saying that economy, politics, social um, behavior uh, is interconnected, that's maybe not completely new. This is a caricature from 1904 showing Standard Oil, which is today Exxon Mobile Oil, uh, grabbing, wrapping its arms around the White House, the capital, steel industry, and so on and so forth. And I mean, the situation hasn't changed much, but it really exemplifies how these specific local spatial items are part of a larger network. And that has led me to come up with this um, scheme to say, if we want to study the petroleum scape, we have to study all of its components. There is industry, there are big petroleum refinery, storage tanks, pipelines, and so on. There is retail. That's the part where the customer sees the oil, the service stations, the gas stations, whatever you want to call them. But there's also the administration where all these flows are actually being steered. The headquarters, often places that look very fancy modern architecture, or at least whatever is the leading style of its uh, period. And it's important to look at it in conjunction because most historical or books on, his, on, on architecture history might talk about the gas station or might talk about the headquarter or might talk about a specific city. But what I'm trying to do is to bring together this entire scape, this network of, uh, that is really interconnected and um, supporting itself. And part of this, whenever needed, is also the auxiliary construction. That is, in specific locations, the oil companies, the state, will erect housing, movie cinemas, hospitals, daycare, to facilitate the oil extraction, transformation, or transportation. And often infrastructure is related to it. You need to build streets, rail, pipelines to get the oil out, to distribute it, to get it to the centers, metropolises where it's actually consumed. And importantly, um, it also goes into plastics, including, and that's important for architects, the house itself. Oil industry has made a lot of uh, attempts to promote philanthropy or to inscribe itself in philanthropy, which means that you often have elements that look completely disconnected from oil, uh, but that are part of its funding mechanism. Now, this is the layer for me of space, and you could probably add other uses of space in here, but this is the place where I started. And then the question, the second question based on this is this one, the representational part. So what do we see of this first line? And you can ask yourself, how many refineries have you visited? And I would be quite surprised if anybody has visited a refinery. Um, how many times have you gone into an oil site? They are usually very close and you probably don't even see them, at least in Western Europe, when many of them are actually de-branded and you don't even have names on them. But what you see is the gas station, which is kind of the friendly place where you can also buy your, or you could buy your milk on a Sunday when the shops were not opened. Um, and so you get a very different imaginary of the oil spaces than the actual reality of these oil spaces. In the end, there's also a part of oil going into our language, and that would be this one for me here, and I haven't gotten into that. But let me first illustrate you this scheme here through concrete architectural artifacts. And I'm going to run through them quite quickly, um, more to give you an idea what it is that I'm talking about than to get into the detail of each. So we talked about the industrial oil. And the industrial oil, this is uh, Titusville, Pennsylvania at the very beginning. Uh, industrial oil is really global. The forms that we see there are purely technical. They're about drilling. They're about extracting 
the oil from the ground, often creating very polluted landscapes as here in Pennsylvania. Then we have the part of the infrastructure. How do you get the oil from the sites that are often rather lost of, well, difficult to reach rural areas from the Amazon to the deep waters or from the uh, deep hinterland in Pennsylvania here to the, to the coast and to the consumers. And that has a lot of implications on safety and storage. Interestingly, much of the intervention in the begin uh, in terms of legalization was about fire hazards. So firemen uh, came up with all kinds of laws about how to preserve them and um, protecting the water from oil pollution. Now, these decisions on how to transport the petroleum have global impact. For example, the Dutch and the English uh, had, the British had this company, which is today Shell, Royal Dutch Shell. Um, so it was about reaching the extraction sites in Indonesia and getting the oil to Western Europe. Uh, the Suez Canal was already built but the Shell company became big because it built the first tanker ship, the SS Murex that you see here, that was allowed to cross the Suez Canal, which means getting through here was much easier than going all the way around Africa. And it had geopolitical impact on the entire Mediterranean on the construction of cities like Suez City and other connections, uh, other cities on the Suez Canal. And even the development of Egypt depended on these kinds of installations. Now, you might ask yourself, what kind of structures are we actually talking about? And in some ways, refining, which is heating up petroleum to separate it into different types of gasoline, uh, uh, gas, et cetera, et cetera, diesel um, through heat, and then using these different components. That's what refining is about. That's how it looked in, in the Belmont refinery in, in Philadelphia in the 1860s. And it's pretty much the same how oil is being split into elements up to today. Now, the chemists had to find different uses for each of these products. And I think that's very important to understand. Whenever you get a barrel of oil out of the ground, you want to use as many of these components as possible. You don't want to burn off the gas or let parts of it disappear. So even if you only use a part of the barrel for say plastic or for health purposes, you still want to get rid of all the other components that you can distill out of the, uh, the barrel of oil. But what you also see here is that oil is very closely linked to water. And uh, a, any chemist will tell you oil and water don't mix, but in port city regions, they actually do. You need water for the industrial uh, process, but you also need water for shipping. So you will find many images that look like the one on the left. In uh, Philadelphia, beautiful blue water, green fields, a refinery oil storage site between uh, apple yards. But on the right, you see how this site has looked until very recently. This was the longest ever running refinery, and it's really not clear how the soil looks underneath it. So this kind of heritage requires extensive cleanup. And already it was a global site in the sense that 50% of the oil shipped from Philadelphia actually went to China. And these famous lamps that you see here were used as a way to entice Chinese customers to actually consume more oil. And these landscapes you can find around the world. This is an example here from Rotterdam. But they are really not something that you see on a regular basis. I was lucky enough to take the picture on the right from an airplane one day, but you have probably seen similar ones. And they are identical around the world. What is less identical are the gas stations. In the beginning, they were the means to get the car uh, drivers through the landscape. You had to have a place where to fuel up around, along the way. So the construction of infrastructure, the building of roads went hand in hand with these little, these little structures. And in the beginning, there were kind of cute little buildings, 
which over time attracted architectural interest. Here, an example from the Netherlands, or just because it's so beautiful here, two more. So they become icon, iconic structures. Some of them are heritage sites, uh, well preserved, as the one, for example, here is an architect's office. But what the oil companies needed was uh, recognizability around the world. And in the 1970s, they developed these kinds of clip on items for a much more reduced type of gas stations so that you could worldwide recognize the colors, the logos of these, um, of the various gas companies. And they became really standardized. And if you ask yourself when, and I've done that with my students, asking them to draw a mental map, say of their home to the university, uh, at least in the US, and it's when I was in the US, but it's starting to change, uh, everybody would have a moment where they'd say, oh, turn right at the gas station. So this imaginary of oil was embedded in your everyday language because these were the buildings that stood out. Now, following my scheme from the beginning, what then are the headquarters and where are they located? This was a building, the first oil exchange in uh, Titusville. Now, Titusville, I don't think anybody of you has heard about it in a regular classroom, I would just ask, but this building disappeared very quickly. So oil was extracted from Western Pennsylvania. The oil flows went to the coast, like Philadelphia, where I just showed you the, the port, but the money flows went to another city. They didn't stay in Titusville. And they went, in this case, mostly to, to New York, but you also have London, The Hague, and other of these places, other capitals or economic metropolises, where the money accumulated. And there, these buildings became icons, often, well, there's very little scene connected to the location where the oil was actually extracted. And here's the building of Shell in The Hague. So very clearly, um, they, they wanted to be next to the ministries. There are actually letters saying, yes, we need a location in The Hague right next to where they, the, ministers were, 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 the ministries were located. And the architects often being asked to build these buildings in contrast to the gas stations that we just saw were ones who were involved in the conservative buildings, the big museum uh, and that kind of, of buildings. Now, over the time, the headquarter design changes, but it often becomes the outstanding building of something, whatever the leading uh, argument is of its time. Intervention and construction of additional, what I call auxiliary structures, happens only where it's really needed. So for example, in southern Iran, uh, there, were only, there was only the desert, there were no cities existing, so they couldn't latch on to existing structures, whether it's Titusville, Philadelphia, or New York type of building, their cities. So they actually built an entire city around a refinery. And similar to what I showed you before, in the beginning, oil was not seen as particular as a health hazard or as an environmental risk as we see it today. So you might have some differences, the uh, rich people being established on one side on the refinery with the workers on another side. But in this case, in um, Abadan, you have Garden City ideas from BP being exported from England to Iran, implemented there so that you have housing for all these engineers and their families and the workers uh, based on what were modern or of the time leading architectural and urban principles. And we see this construction around oil even today. I mean, these are definitely cities that you have seen from Dubai to um, uh, Abu Dhabi and so on and so forth. And it's embedded in our imaginary even in Western countries. So Norway in particular is a country that thrives of oil. This is the Petroleum, Petroleum Museum in Stavanger where the architectural language of the petroleum um, storage sites is being part of the museum design itself. What's interesting about this is that the oil connection survives even in heritage sites. So in this case in Sydney, BP Park, here storage tanks were taken out 
uh, the circles of the storage tanks have been preserved. The uh, elements of this, the former site are still there. So the site becomes known as BP Park. But the discussion of whether we want this prominence of oil industries, even in our heritage, and how we narrate their presence, particularly also in, the, in terms of the question of what do we do with it in the future, still remains open, or I think should be um, well discussed more thoroughly. Similar, a bridge like this one, which is BP Bridge in Chicago, where BP works with Frank Gehry to build a beautiful pedestrian bridge. What kind of story does that tell us for our um, societal narrative, for the uh, story that we all share? But I cannot help but share, share this one because it really raises questions for architects and designers, planners. So on your left, you have a LEED certified gas station. So LEED certification is an American system of crediting green uh, buildings, of giving points for advanced, uh, well, sustainable um, interventions. And this gas station has a lot of these sustainable elements, rainwater collection, et cetera, et cetera. But it still serves a very unsustainable practice. So is this now an iconic building for sustainability or is it not? Similarly, on the right, you see a cruise ship in Hamburg, um, Germany. Hamburg was voted green capital, but often the calculations that people will do to, to label something sustainable will depend on a fixed space. So a cruise ship, which is on shore and still is, and is maybe not connected to electricity, will still um, blast out CO2 so that and that in the order of hundreds of hundreds of thousands or so cars. So how green is the city then if it is located or this district right next to a huge cruise ship? So be very careful when you assess sustainability uh, in terms of what is being counted, what stories are being told and how do we assess them? And in that same vein, uh, look at a structure like the King Fuad Way. I had mentioned earlier the Suez Canal and the passing of these big ships and the investment of a company, company like Shell. Now, Shell built what was then the biggest refinery in, in Suez. Afterward, Abadan was the biggest refinery. And so there's a whole story of the biggest uh, refineries, etc. But in this case, they produced um, the asphalt, so one product of the refining process, that is very difficult to use for, say, cars, but it's very good to use for streets. So in that case, the covering and the construction of a street through the desert um, became the opportunity to actually reuse this byproduct of the petroleum process. And that's what I meant earlier by finding always new usages for the one barrel of oil out of which you extract different um, elements and different functions. So in that sense, you could say the highways are the, the cathedrals of the modern age because there's much more, well, there's all this petroleum being laid out um, on the top of the, of the street itself, which raises questions, what are we going to do with these kinds of infrastructures throughout the world that are built within and, and uh, the, the petroleum in itself. Now let me point to one more element of the chain, which is interesting, particularly for architects. So just as a reminder, what was, what's missing here is the, the, the plastic element. So these are the th things that I've mostly talked through. We still talk about philanthropy, but there's also these kinds of buildings and plastic as an oil product was uh, heavily used, well, it has a longer history, but to make it short, uh, it was heavily used in World War II. We could create very lightweight materials, uh, different types of plastics. And after the war, the plastic industry together with um, the universities, MIT and Disneyland created this plastic house to make plastic something that the people, the everyday users would uh, embrace. 
because it was easily kept clean, it was, uh, well, seemed indestructible and so on and so forth. So millions of people visited this house in Disneyland as the plastic house with all kinds of innovations like a, like a predecessor to the microwave, but still very traditional um, to adults, two children type of family and the role of the wife being very much confined to the kitchen. Now, looking at the materials at the archives there, we see that the uh, plastic industry really had hoped that the architects would help them to make plastic into that everyday material, which it today is. But they quickly realized that the architects wouldn't help them, the contractors would. And if you think about your house, again, in the sense of drop your oil, how much plastic is embedded in your carpets, in your windows, in your uh, wall covers, whatever is there, it's everywhere in the, in the construction, in the structure of its house. So in the end, the petroleum industry managed to get into yet another area of the built environment by inscribing it uh, into it. So when you think of uh, fancy buildings, famous buildings like uh, Kurukawa's Nagakin, um, there were lots of elements that could be reused, duplicated, and some of them have made it, for example, into Japanese buildings. Here's a typical Japanese bedroom, a bathroom on your right, which is a prefabricated cabin out of plastic that's popped this way into your apartment. So those are the elements where plastic has really made it into the house and simultaneously into the imaginaries of lots of girls and boys. Similarly, uh, whether it's still plastic building stones or plastic kitchens or other plastic elements that are part of the, the, the daily experiences of toys of, um, of children. And so when you look at these kinds of uh, structures, ask yourself too, what did you play with? How did you grow up? How was plastic introduced into your lives? I also mentioned the way uh, that philanthropy has transformed the landscape. This is from life in the 1950s, showing how this one pipeline was broken up in 1911. So Standard Oil is split up into different companies. These companies are almost all back together or much more conf confined again. But here they show the Standard Oil philanthropies or I should say the Rockefeller philanthropies as one outcome of this oil business. Now, in general, um, Standard Oil is kept apart from the Rockefeller name. The Rockefeller name will be attached to buildings like these, the Peking, Peking Union Medical College, to national parks, to the transformation of New York. And so these are all very, uh, well, philanthropic endeavors, bringing health to China, bringing nature to the United States, or even reconstructing Williamsburg, which is a really iconic site in the United States. And I went into the archives to, to look more closely into that story. And when you uh, study, for example, Williamsburg, you will see that the Rockefellers used the opportunity of Williamsburg to provide a setting for meetings with famous politicians, including kings and queens and even the emperor of Japan, but also that many of their oil friends from Latin America were actually being hosted in, in, the, in the hotel of, of Williamsburg. So the narrative that philanthropy is completely different from the oil business just doesn't stand up. Now, what is the story then? And that's where philanthropy makes this nice link. What's the story then between um, the oil that is there, that is physically written into the environment as an object or as, a, as, a, as money, and its representation? So what do the people see? Well, those are the kinds of advertisements that we are being served. There is no refinery when you see Britain first on Shell. Or when you look at the Netherlands, and I've just given you here a selection of these free handout cards of the Netherlands, it's all about uh, cute mills and tulips and small houses and uh, those kinds of elements.
it's very rare that you would see a refinery. And when you see it, it's probably actually embedded in green and doesn't look very scary. And much of the literature is also even about uh, environmentalism, about uh, greening. Uh, so for example, these kinds of brochures and apps. Architecture has, paid, has played a big role in promoting oil. Uh, you all probably know Le Corbusier and the, uh, his uh, city for Paris, his planning. But did you know and recognize that it was paid for by a car maker? Frank Lloyd Wright's broad acre cities would not have been possible without uh, individual traffic. And that's probably the, the main example for the suburbia in the United States, which heavily depends on cars. And once these structures are written into space, are built, it's very hard to get away from them. Because if you live somewhere off in a small city in the United States, there's no way that without a car, you can easily get somewhere because there is not the public transport that you would expect or even the chance to go biking. This was an ad in the beginning by Shell, the Shell company again, for a high rise city with uh, highways. This ad was then being picked up because it was so powerful and used together with General Motors in the World's Fair of 1939. So this collaboration of oil, cars, uh, media, architecture is a, very, is a very powerful one. And occasionally, this connection even occurred directly when, particularly in the 1960s, architects looked at refineries and translated these into their design. Artists were captivated by uh, oil and its different artifacts. Just think about gas stations, and you can probably come up with similar examples from your own specific cities. And then the everyday culture, and I already spoke about that a bit in terms of plastics, you see gas stations as Lego stations being promoted, even with the label of the company on it, here in this case, Esso. Raising the question, well, what, so what does this mean if from your early days as a child playing on, you are being educated to promote oil? I guess there are now, but I should check, uh, solar panels or other devices of uh, alternative energies for um, in Lego that speak a different story. Now let's move on to the present and the future. What should we do with these kinds of structures? How do we memorize them? There are quite a number of oil museums here, one in Germany. There are places like this one on the left that are being preserved. But what are we going to do with these sites? We may be able to preserve a gas station or even a headquarter like this one, the former Shell headquarter in Amsterdam, but we are have much more trouble conserving and preserving, if we wanted to, these huge um, buildings like these ones. So how can we use this knowledge to actually construct a different approach to oil. Once we've understood how deeply oil is inscribed in our environment, what are we going to do with it? How can particular designers, planners change through their impact, through them serving as multiple players, how can they transform the built environment? And a young illustrator, Anna uh, Jena Arts, made this drawing based on what I've been working about, transforming a famous Dutch painting of the milkmaid into the oil maid. She also produced the image on the, on the right, putting this famous house in Delft, alternating it with these uh, gas stations up front. So we need some find ways to capture the imaginaries of people to make them aware of the spatial impact of oil. One way to do that is uh, through mapping. Uh, you are probably aware of where I am. So in the area here close to between Rotterdam and, and Amsterdam, but you're probably less aware that this is the second biggest petroleum complex after Houston. Because people usually think about this area as, again, windmills, tulips, and little cute houses. Now, when we take an area of this, 
and we look at the way in which oil has transformed it. I'll just run you quickly through the historic development. This is the city of Rotterdam, and you'll see this way towards Delft and then towards The Hague. Look at the way in which the waterway is transforming to accommodate the ships. Look at the way in which the port is expanding in black and the uh, oil in red that is being um, built. So we see here, before the war, the first big extensions for oil. After the war, and particularly after decolonization, all the big refineries that were lost in, the, uh, in areas around the world, being brought back to Europe so that by 1972, three quarters of the port is about oil. Now, if oil plays that much of an importance to the port of Rotterdam, why? Well, mostly because much of it is actually shipped through to Germany and Belgium and piped through by pipelines. So that means even if the entire Netherlands would go green, um, that doesn't really help because much of it actually crosses the borders. Now, in line with the petroleum scape, we've also mapped it in a different way, bringing in gas stations and uh, headquarters. And I've talked to you, I've shown you before the headquarter of Shell in The Hague. Now, the, the Rotterdam here grows with and around the physical quality of oil, the big, the, the, the fluid. The Hague hosts funding. And when you see this growth happening, you see the construction of specific bridges so that you can reach the south of the river, otherwise you can't get to it. But you see, and this is always um, one of the, the, the images that I really like pointing out, these are the orange dots are the first gas stations that I've been able to find. I'm not guaranteeing that there are not more, but those are the ones I've come across. From what this map tells me right now is that there are way more gas stations in The Hague than in Rotterdam where I can maybe find two or three little dots. Although Rotterdam is the biggest city right next to the oil. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that there were probably way more rich people up here near the ministries that could afford these early cars. And so these tool, this mapping becomes a tool to better understand the weight of the historical information. So the, we've done this mapping and you can find it back in the article for then in about 30 year spans for the 1970s, 2000. And you see how oil literally builds the landscape. Understanding this is particularly important if we want to go beyond oil, if we want to go towards green energies, because the oil infrastructure has created path dependencies. It has created structures that are not that easily to be overcome. We have to deal with the, even the electricity infrastructure that has been built in the oil era. And so we can see that in this case, we have now started to map the, the green energy construction. Even the green energy construction will repeat many of the facets that we've observed in the petroleum period, whether it is where the first um, uh, windmills will go, they will go to the port because that's also where the money is. They will go into these areas where the money is. And often the areas that might benefit most are not the ones that get it. So in the 2018, we've even mapped the, um, the places where you can plug in to get electricity for your car, which are often then uh, um, parking spaces that you don't have to pay for. So questions of um, inequalities in society are being raised through these kinds of mapping. Um, and so mapping really becomes a research tool, which is what I was trying to say. Now let me do one more step, um, uh, being in mind that I probably have about five minutes left. Um, so we've been using this story also to make design projects. So I've been giving what I just told you in a very short form, I've been giving that as a course, uh, having students work on it, work on different locations. And we've used the city of Dunkirk in northern France, a working class city near a port, as one of our places for um, investigation. Dunkirk is interesting because it, is, it has a refinery that has just been closed. 
So you can look at a port city that is finding a new future and what that means for the economy. And you see that the disappearance of the um, historic, the, the traditional petroleum uh, uh, economy changes the entire setting of the regional uh, economic network. But it also raises questions of how to rebuild it and what to do with it. And I think what you've also seen in the presentation so far is that imaginaries play an important role. So students have picked this up through different projects. And so you've got here the city of Dunkirk, the historic city of Dunkirk, the new port, um, and then various sites where students have made their projects. So they have embedded their projects in the entire region of Dunkirk. And the result of these projects, we've asked them to look at it both from a perspective of narratives, which has sometimes led to more utopian or dystopian visions. So one of the students took this idea and said, well, oil is almost gone, the refinery is closed, we still need oil for medical purposes, for example. So the whole city of Dunkirk with its historical town hall and historical buildings is uh, on top of the refinery trying to preserve the last drops of oil, but the, the city itself uh, is a gaming society which has uh, windmills that serve gaming and consumption is uh, here with all the containers and um, the, the shipping containers actually serve also as the, as the, um, as the sales points. So uh, I had asked that we had asked students to produce a kind of design fiction, a narrative, and he had come up with this story that different four different com companies were actually fighting each other and had come up with an kind of alternative history, but really more a dystopia, similar to the project on the right. Other students used, um, well, the idea of, of self-running um, machines that would clean up the soil, because that's one of the big problems we will be facing way beyond the uh, reconstruction of the traditional waterfronts, where we have some cute cranes and warehouses, but these are much bigger sites with much more environmental challenges to be tackled. And we need to design transition strategies that have a horizon of some 20, 30, 50 years until we can actually effectively reuse them. Another group made a much more detailed and perhaps more concrete analysis of the port of Rotterdam to see how and what we could do to reconstruct it. And I've shown you these images of the analysis. And as I said before, my goal would be to use the historical analysis to uh, inspire the design of the future. So if you look at the history of Rotterdam from this perspective, what should then be your project um, uh, and your design? So the students took up that challenge in, in various ways. I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but these were the various uh, transition strategies they imagined. I was really intrigued by this particular project by five students because they also looked at the verticality of it. And I think it's really important to keep in mind the ter territory and even the depth of the soil uh, because it's very polluted, including also the, the part of the air, because you cannot limit yourself just to the part of the port city. You also have to think of the air that way, goes way beyond the borders of the port. So they assigned different functions to a port of Rotterdam to be redesigned and rethought, where you had uh, wind um, elements that would capture energy. It included sites for birds. So they tried to address all the projects, the problems they could find in the port, and then um, rethink them, and ultimately even designed um, architecture projects based on these proposals. Um, let me finish by showing you one last project, which I think is quite uh, interesting, also in line with this idea of design fiction. Uh, another student at Delft who just graduated, Lukas Heller in urbanism, thought about this theme of um, port city regions through the lens of commodity flows and also of oil.
So if you imagine that the that climate change will open up new passages like the Arctic route, how can we design ports in up all the way up there in Norway that speak to future needs? So he, that's what he tried to conceptualize here, looking into the port cityscape. So I'm crossing my petroleum scape with the port cityscape to understand what is this large ecosystem, large network that we need to understand to really go from a petroleum-based um, period where, that, where we have built over 150 years the entire structures to a green one, uh, acknowledging the ways in which the old petroleum scape will define the new one, acknowledging that we need to have the same power of imaginaries and think about Hollywood films on oil, think about the ways in which gas stations have been celebrated in art and so on and so forth. We will need similar strong um, approaches and imaginaries to actually overcome petroleum and overcome the petroleum scape. Thank you very much. <laughs>